When people speculate on what could bring the bull market to an end, the list invariably includes a couple of things that you might have some insight into. One, a sudden acceleration in U.S. inflation that causes the Fed to slam on the brakes. And the second is a blow-up somewhere in the European sovereign debt market, possibly Italy. Which of those two worry you the most? Well, I don't know which uh, I guess we're supposed to worry about more, but I would say that the U.S. economy is is going about as well as we could hope for. So uh, again, if you're uh, one of those types of folks, which I guess I am, is the better things are, the more I worry. Um, I think generally it's, is the U.S. moving too fast? Uh, is the economy growing too rapidly? But uh, there, there might be a third option that you didn't mention, just as an aside. And Please. I think these, these midterm elections uh, could also have an impact on the U.S. economy. And you could have, uh, uh, shall we say, a, a transition to people wanting uh, dramatic change, even at the cost or at the risk of having a real negative impact on our economic growth. What do you think? These are questions that you raise. I'm more interested in your opinion. <laughs> I think there's a real change, a real possibility of, uh, of folks uh, making politics more important than the economy. And that's not good for the economy. Mike, since we're talking about the U.S. economy, the big debate at the moment around growth is whether it's a short-lived sugar high, mm -hmm. right? Fueled in part by the tax cut, that's a big factor, no question. Sure. But also other things like a ramp up in imports as companies build up inventories ahead of tariffs, for example. Mm -hmm. um, or is it something more sustainable? Where do you guys come well, down? Look, uh, the good news is Aries has investments in 1,500 middle market companies across the platform. Um, investments all over the real economy, real estate, structured credit, uh, energy infrastructure. And as Tony mentioned, all of the fundamental data that we see shows that the economy is on extremely solid fundamental footing. Um, one can argue that we've seen an acceleration uh, on the heels of changes to the tax code, but uh, the mood in the boardroom is, is very good. Uh, revenue growth is strong. Earnings growth is strong. So I think that this is sustainable for sure. Sustainable for how long? That's always the question. Uh, and I think anybody who tells you that they can predict perfectly is probably uh, not telling you the truth. I think that the way that we try to position uh, the business, given what we do, is we have to be directionally accurate. Uh, we can't time the market. That's not what our investors give us capital for. We have to be directionally accurate in terms of are we later stage or not, and how will that inform our investment behavior. Uh, given most of what we do on the alternative credit side, as a result of where we are in the cycle, despite the solid fundamentals, we're moving up the balance sheet, we're shortening duration, we're focusing on senior secured assets. So uh, we have repositioned just given the length of the cycle, but there's nothing in the portfolio that would indicate that, that, uh, that it's going to end anytime soon. One of the benefits to having a portfolio as large as yours, in private equity on the one hand and private credit on the other, is that you see what's happening in your companies. Do you see any evidence that some of the things that are common, if you will, to a, you know, a, a roaring economy, wage inflation, for example, higher commodity prices, and at the same time we have this tariffs issue, do, do you see any evidence that they're creating cost problems for your portfolio companies? I think there's some evidence of finding, keeping, retaining employees. Uh, is becoming more and more difficult, more and more expensive. Again, let, let's not get confused. That, that's actually a good thing for the U.S. economy to have uh, workers feeling empowered and important. So from my perspective, that's actually a good thing, but absolutely impacting our portfolio companies. But again, as Mike was describing, if we have uh, something in the neighborhood of a thousand middle market companies we see on a weekly, monthly, quarterly basis, uh, another, well, maybe more like 1,500 and another thousand publicly traded companies in our liquid credit business, along with our private equity businesses, we see a great deal of businesses every week, every quarter at the very latest. And, and the U.S., uh, the U.S. economy is strong. Um, we are seeing across the board revenue and cash flow improvements. So we have a very strong economy. And our job, as I said, is uh, yes, maybe to worry in a strong economy. But above all, you can move to cash or you can move to quality. From our perspective, we get paid to move to quality.
to, to make sure that our underwriting standards don't change, that we don't stretch for yield in a market like this, we stretch for quality. That's the important factor. And uh, again, at the end of the day, are we seeing quality businesses that we could lend to, that we could invest in, that we feel good about? And the answer is emphatically yes. The European economy is nowhere near as healthy as the American economy. It's growing slower, and there are some obviously some policy differences mm -hmm, among mm -hmm. countries. And there's real political risk here in a way that doesn't exist uh, in the United States. Different political risk. Different political <laughs> risk. Well, right? There's political risk in the United States. Sure, sure, it's different. different political risk. Uh, but Brexit, of course, sure. probably yeah. tops the list, but there are lots of others. You've just raised, as of a couple of months ago, six and a half billion euros, seven and a half billion dollar yeah. fund for European direct lending. What is it about the European economy and the outlook for the continent that makes you comfortable extending credit here at this point in the credit cycle? Well, remember, one of the reasons we like the credit business is the credit business performs regardless of the trajectory of the economy. And in many respects, it performs better in a slower growth economy because the duration of your assets extends, you get paid more for similar risk. So when we talk about a slower growth economy in Europe, that's actually a good thing for the direct lending business, uh, which may be somewhat Paradoxical almost, yes. Um, the other thing, too, while you have jurisdictional issues, we've built a pan-European footprint here at Aries. So in the wake of Brexit, we've actually see, seen a shift in deal flow more towards the continent. So uh, pre-Brexit... You're doing more business in the continent than you are in London correct, or in the UK. Correct, and that was not the same five years ago. Where were you five years ago? I was probably 50-50 five years ago, and it's probably skewed now 70-30. And that's something you expect to persist, or is that going to change come next April when, we're, when, when we will, this country, at the very least, is on the other yeah, side I of Brexit, we, I whatever we that looks like? We're going to have to wait and see. I think the nice thing is the business is built to, uh, to move around the continent and find opportunities where, where we can. Tony, this is your, if I'm not mistaken, this is your fourth credit cycle. How be, does what you see today compare with what you observed in the late 1980s? in the late 1990s into the dot-com bubble and the years before the financial crisis? Well, I think the, uh, I would argue each of the uh, adjustments that we've seen over the last 30 years or so, uh, the marketplace has learned and has become somewhat smarter and yet repeats some of the same mistakes. Uh, the biggest, uh, I would argue, lesson learned is that the financial institutions of today are much better run much more transparent than the financial institutions of yesteryear. Uh, that's a huge, huge distinction, in my opinion. And if you will, not that that's going to avoid adjustments, meaningful adjustments in the years to come, but I, I would argue at least uh, less uh, catastrophic because of uh, cleaner, more transparent financial institutions, more capable of withstanding the pain and suffering. I think Couldn't the problems be outside the banking system, though? No doubt. It's no possible. Doubt. I think you're, you're seeing less systemically uh, systemically risky leverage, which has been the precursor to some of the prior liquidity cycles. My own perspective, given everything that we do as well, is most of the assets that we invest in and that we see lining up globally, the risk return, while not what investors would want, seem to make sense on a relative basis. So the investor globally is saying, do I want to be in global equities, traditional fixed income alternatives, and within that, but the pricing and the return is actually quite rational. I think in prior cycles, you've seen uh, distortions in certain asset markets that would tell you there are structural imbalances at play that we're just not seeing to the same extent. Well, that's investors within alternatives also have to choose between the asset classes sure they, they want to be in. If they want credit, Aries is a natural stop. Your private equity business, your real estate business is undersized relative to your credit business. Can we anticipate an expansion in either of those? Well, one, uh, yes, it's undersized if you're viewing uh, um, assets under management, it's clearly smaller than our credit business. But to me, our, our private equity business, as well as our real estate private equity business, if you look at its performance, uh, I would argue it's certainly large enough to perform at or above its competitors. So we love the middle market private equity businesses that we have. And yes, to answer your question specifically, we think both will grow. <laughs> will there be consolidation in the alternative asset For industry? Sure. There will be. Absolutely. There will be. And it's already taking place. And there are many asset managers uh, that simply will not get to scale. 
and there are many, many large investors that simply don't want to deal with a long list of providers. So does that mean Aries will be a consolidator? Well, Aries has one been, or the other. Yeah, <laughs> better well, to be a consolidator than a consolidator. <laughs> but Aries, as you know, we have made a number of acquisitions in our history where we're acquiring capabilities that we don't currently have or expanding into new markets. We've also had significant acquisitions that we haven't done. Um, but there is, without a doubt, a consolidation trend. And interestingly, in the alternative markets, and our investors, I think, appreciate this more than ever, size benefits performance. The mindset historically is the larger you get, the harder it is to outperform. And I think as we and our peers have demonstrated, the benefits of scale in terms of investing in origination, capturing research and information synergies, it's undeniable. So as that shows up in better performance, naturally you'd expect the larger platforms to attract more assets. But like many of our competitors, again, we see the world predominantly of North America and European assets. And we see enormous opportunity to grow all three of our pools of capital just in those two geographic areas. 